Welcome to The Outcast, the podcast from Outlaw Pro, the ultimate angling experience. Well, hello and welcome to another fantastic episode of The Outcast, the podcast from Outlaw Pro. Now, we have got a fantastic guest in today, a man that you will all have heard of, who's caught some incredible fish, but more of him later. Before then, let's just have a quick recap on what's been going on in the world of Outlaw Pro. Well, for a start, the huge news at the moment is we have got a new store opening up in Tadley, uh, not far from Basingstoke, Reading and Newbury, sort of in a triangle there of Carp World. And it's going to be a brilliant new store. So that's going to be coming soon. We'll bring you plenty of news about that as and when we go through. We've got some fantastic bait. We've got some fantastic products. We've got all sorts of stuff going on. And also, don't forget, we've got our membership scheme. I'm going to remind you of this again and again and again. Why? Because it saves you money. Sign up to our membership scheme. You get 10% off every Outlaw Pro product within the store or online. And also you get 5% off certain items of other manufacturers through the store as well. So uh, do sign up to that. Anyway, that's the news from us for the time being. Let's welcome our guest. Now, our guest has been around quite a long time. He's caught some incredible fish. He is, without any shadow of doubt, one of the country's best, most well-known big fish haulers. Not just anglers, because he's got a long track record. It is a good friend of Outlaw Pro 2, none other than Nigel Sharp. There we go. How was that for an introduction? Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> good to have you over. You've come from the west side of London, so you live over uh, over Reading Way anyway. Yeah, right? around the other side, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it'd be close when we've got the new shop for you, won't it? Very close, within walking distance. Uh, that'd be nice. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, what are you up to at the moment? Tell me about your fishing. Uh, I'm fishing on the lakes over at Reading, trying to ca- catch a big common. I seem to like a big common, don't I? So, but yeah, this is a bit of an ongoing campaign. It's been going on for three or four years now, so I'm uh, well through it. So I caught a lot of the fish in the lakes, some of them several times. And you know, it's, if you feel close, then you don't. It's you know an ongoing thing, but it's an an itch I keep having to scratch. So I won't give up. Not what is it? Can you tell us where it is or what it is? It's a uh, it's a big common. It's actually called the Prestine. Right. Um, it's in uh, one of the Reading waters, Farnham Flint. Right. Uh, it's on the Pingewood complex. So yeah. It's a nice, late, proper, mature old gravel pit. It's like a miniature Burfield, really, right next Lovely. door to Burfield. So. Clear water and weedy, then? Yeah, that's yeah. the one. <laughs> yeah. So how big is it? Well, the lake. No, the, the fish. fish. <laughs> yeah, the fish. <laughs> the fish, um, I think its top weight's just over 57 pounds. Is so. it really? Yeah, it'd Mega. be a PB for me if I'm lucky enough to catch it. Yeah. Oh, you'll crossed. get it. Yeah. You'll get it. Well, there will be two outcomes. I'll either catch it or it'll die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's not many that have evaded you so far, really, is there? Well, no. You just got to keep going. Never give up, do you? No, no. Well, we'll look. We'll come to that a little bit later. But on your journey for that fish, you've had a bit of success already, haven't you? What have you been catching? I've, like I said, I've caught several of them. Well, I've caught most of the lakes stock, most of the A team, some of them several times, and. Um, it's just got to keep going, and this year I've sort of hit the ground running. It's fairly local to me, so I walk it a lot. I've walked it like every other day since Christmas, done yeah. a lot of leg work, waited for them fish to come within range because there's a couple of distant, safe areas that are tricky to get at, and um, when I see them start coming into range, start fishing. And So far, I think we're seven weeks into this year's campaign, and I haven't blanked a session yet. I think I've averaged um, a fish a night, and I've done 19 nights, so right. I've 19 fish, so right. pretty pretty good like i don't think i've done that well before but yeah you've had a couple of decent ones as well yeah you? i've had fish up to 46 pounds so I, well 46 12 is the biggest and you know the second biggest common in the lake so it's a good buzz i have met that fish before but it sort of proves you're getting things right but sometimes yeah. other fish get in the way of the big one don't they you the, know? yeah yeah <laughs> that's it's a weird one isn't it you know you 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 want to catch a certain target. You know, I'm, I'm not a target hunter mm. for an individual fish. I have a target weight, so I mm. will go out and I will try and chase a, you know, a 60-pounder mm. or a 70-pounder. Yeah. But I'm after the number. I'm not necessarily after the fish. So it's yeah. it's slightly yeah. different for me. I don't mind which 60-pounder it mm. is as long as it's a 60-pounder. Yeah. But, you know, the, the it must be, I'm not going to say frustrating, but it will be a frustration if you're trying to catch a certain fish and you keep catching other fish irrespective of how big they mm. are. 
Yeah, it can be frustrating. Um, these <laughs> spin the clock back years ago. Lakes used to have like one per acre, which yeah. was an average carp lake. So, like when I fished over on the Yatey Complex, car park lake, for instance, doesn't fish in that many acres. Yeah, it kind of makes it easier to catch your target fish. Well, that, you know, we'll talk about that campaign <laughs> campaign later on or whatever, but. Yeah. When there's less fish, it's easier to pick the one you want out. But the lakes these days tend to have heavier stocks, so there's a lot more to get in the way. Yeah. And this is kind of what happened on Burfield, and this thing is repeating again for me. I'm sort of stuck into one of them campaigns. With so how how do you solve that? What do you do? Is it is it because uh, I'll use Crow as a prime example? He was targeting um, butthead up in uh, up north as well. Mm-hmm. You know that's a that's a huge fish in a lake with an awful lot of fish in it. Mm. And and his general view was. Go to where the carp aren't, which is completely <laughs> alien. Uh, yeah, I can understand that because where the carp aren't, there's obviously less fish about, and if that one comes into the the area, you've yeah. got a better chance of hooking it. I mean, going back to Burfield, I had chances when there was only three fish about and nailed the wrong one a couple of times yeah. and things like that. But when there's fifty fish about, there's very you know it's, it's odds and it? it's percentages. Yeah. And the chances are one other than the one that you yeah. want is going to be the hungrier one. And the other thing is is I've got a very good memory. You make mental notes like I know places I've seen this fish feed t- three years ago. So yeah. when I go in that uh, certain swim that it's about, I'll always put a bait on that spot, yeah. whether it's been on it that day or not. It's just that I saw it feed there once. So there's something that he likes about it, you know. And it, it, it's, it's an interesting mentality that as well that you know I, I spend a lot of time swimming with them, obviously, and mm. and. They are without any shadow of doubt creatures of habit. Yeah. There are areas they want to mm. live. There are areas they like to mm. sit. There are areas they'll feed. Mm. Of course, they can come from anywhere. Mm. But actually, you know, the older the fish, which probably resonates mm. with the bigger the fish because they've yeah. been around a lot longer, they are such creatures of habit. Yeah, they're masters of their own environment, aren't they? So yeah. they know where to be at certain times, you know. And other, they're, they're buddies as well. I mean, the, the lake I'm currently fishing, a bit like Burfield was at the time, it's got an old stock of big fish, yeah. but there's a lot of newer stock, younger fish, and them older ones, like you say, they're set in their ways, they're in their habits. So if you can find them older fish, there's a you, you're up in your chances of getting close to that fish all the time. And, you know, the, obviously the smaller stockies and that can get in the way, and <laughs> it's, it's just a yeah. process you've just got to keep going it's, It is a completely different mindset to mm. just going fishing, though, isn't it? You know, if you go yeah. fishing for bites, yeah. it's a totally different mindset to go and fishing for a specific yeah, creature. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you could... I suppose in some ways you could liken it to different types of soldiers, you know. Some yeah. are infantry men and they're fighting the line and then yeah. you get a sniper who wants his target. You know, he's got he's got a certain thing that he's got a snipe at and yeah. kind of like that really with fishing and yeah. or this type of fishing I do, you know. And that's what you call it, a target fish. It's your target, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah good analogy. Mm. It, it's, you know, to be a big fish angler is, it takes a hell of a lot of sacrifice, doesn't it? It takes Very dedication. So. You've got to dedicate you to it. Mm. It will dedicate yourself to it first mm-hmm. and foremost, but you know people see the photograph, they don't actually see what goes on behind that. And mm. you know, number one, the majority of the time, I'd say it takes a lot of time. Yeah, but it's not <clears throat> just the time; it's everything that goes with it. Yeah, you know that that does 100%. come with a lot of sacrifice. Yeah, I mean myself, I've led a very selfish life for a long period of time. I've only, I don't know. Can I use any language? I only had my cock to keep, sort of thing. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, I could do what I want yeah. day to day. For years I've done that, and if I feel I need to stay another night or another two nights or whatever, I'll just do it. Yeah. But now obviously life's changed for me in the last couple of years, so I can't be as selfish. Yeah. Although I'm lucky I have an understanding girlfriend who, who helps out with this obsession. But, um, yeah, I... I'm in a lucky position. I fish for my living now, which yeah. is, you know, I've done it for quite a long time, nearly two decades. And people would label myself as being a full-time angler, which I don't fish that long. I normally fish a maximum of three nights a week. Mm. But I'm when I'm at home, I'm preparing, and that can be two or three days of getting everything right because the minute I get in my car from my house and drive, I don't, you know, the only time I get out of that car to go to the lake is when I'm at the lake yeah. you know I don't stop at shops or anything and when I'm at the lake I stay at the lake I'm not nipping up the shop or down the calf or yeah. anything I'm focused you know yeah. tunnel vision that's 
a sort of sacrifice your home life as well gets affected by it and yeah i could do more nights but i don't feel i fish effectively if i'm not as prepared so yeah no i think there's a, there's a lot to be said for that you know the full timer um it's a label that's banded around quite a mm. lot but you, you know this full time is seven days a week isn't it yeah, that, yeah. you know that's all i suppose that's yeah. all time full time could be five yeah. days a week but even that yeah. is a lot and i think when you look at a lot of what you would class as full time anglers people mm. that fish all the time they become very stagnant yeah you know very stagnant when, when you get off the lake when you go back it's another session mm. but if you're full time then it just sort of rolls mm. into one um tell tell me about your life Nigel. you know I, i've known you for Ooh, I'm going to go back and, and say 93, 94, mm. which was your early Yately days. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, it was interesting because we're, we're, I don't know how old you are exactly, but we're not far off the same age. Mm. And myself and Crowe, we, we were sort of the, the northern boys that were going around, I suppose, to use your sn- soldier analogy, I'll use one slightly differently. We were going around scoring goals because mm. we wanted to catch fish wherever yeah. we went, lots yeah. of different places, and looking at the likes of you and Tell. Mm. Uh, and Pinky and the guys that were yeah. on the Eightly, you were climbing mountains. Yeah, <laughs> you know we didn't have any mountains by us, or our no. mountains were a lot smaller. Uh, so as a result, we went out and scored goals because mm. there were a lot more fish to catch. Mm. Um, and it was it was really interesting seeing you guys down south, mm. what you were doing when we didn't have the opportunity to do it, and the sort of dedication that you put in. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a whole lifestyle, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. It ruled your life. Really, it's just a, an obsessive lifestyle. You know. Like I say, we wasn't there trying to score as many goals as we could, but we still had certain goals we wanted to score, which I suppose it's like um, you could score lots of goals in lots of different football matches, but, yeah. you know, we was playing at Wembley sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> like that's it. That's why I say they're like the enough. mountains, you yeah. know. They, we didn't have mountains, and they, they, it, it just seemed a, an enormous task mm. going out to catch one particular fish. You know, because there weren't that many around then, weren't no, there? You there know, it was such no. good times. Yeah, I mean, there was probably back in the mid nineties as many forties in the country as some of these lakes hold today. You know, yeah. like, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I, I just I, I look back on the nineties, and you know, carp fishing is where it is now, and people, you know, so you get some of the old farts that grumble about it. Say, no, oh, it's changed too much. It's not <laughs> as good as it was. You know what? Live your life. Yeah. There's no point looking back to what it was because mm. you've had that. Yeah. What you've got now is what you've got now. So make the most of what you've that's got right. now. The youngsters, it's not their fault that that's what they've got now because that's where they are. It's an interesting one. I get quite a lot of young anglers come up to me and, you know, that everyone likes hearing the old Yateley stories now. It seems to be a thing that everyone likes to hear. And uh, they always say, oh, I wish I was about when you, you was. And I said, well, the thing is, you're about now. And when you're my age, you'll have another youngster come up to you saying they wish they was about Oh, and you was so it just moves on doesn't it you know yeah. there's it uh, I, I obviously we all do it on social media we do bits mm. and bobs on social media and I, I i sort of quite like some of the inspirational quotes that come out and, mm. and there's one that's out at the moment that says in 20 years time mm. you will wish that you were 20 years younger yeah and you could do what you're doing now mm. And I think too often people either wistfully look at, at what they used to be, just get on with it now. You know, it's, mm. a, it's a great world. But I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my original thought process on that, actually. I've been distracted. But um, I just think the 1990s was such a good time for carp yeah, fishing. Brilliant. You know, mm. the, the, the whole scene. I, I, I know you like music. Uh, you used to be in the club scene quite a lot yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, I liken the fishing industry a little bit to the music industry as well. Yeah. That if you look at how music's progressed over the yeah. years, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, you had to be a talented musician to make it in the music world. That's right. Yeah. Now there's a lot more manufactured bands. Yeah. There's a lot more opportunities mm. for people to be able to be famous if mm. that's what they want yeah um but back then you got there because you were talented yeah it's very similar in a and, lot of ways that isn't it? yeah and 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 you know the, the the music scene at that time was absolutely fantastic the carp fishing scene at that time mm. was really exploding yeah everything you know, seemed to evolve suddenly didn't it in the late 80s early 90s yeah. with music and like fishing i think um when myself and Terry went onto the big fish side of the road at Yately, like the car park north and Pad Lake, we were quite young then. And I remember, yeah. obviously, Terry caught Basil and I caught Heather. I think mean, Rob Malin caught Jumbo out of Pad Lake the same week. And there's yes. that picture of us three sat on the beach. I think Chris Ball come down and took the photo. And I remember him 
calling us the young guns. And yes. I think that was a turning point in carp fishing that you'd walk around them Yatley lakes and there would generally be older lads on it, right? I suppose middle-aged, you know, yeah, Rob yeah. Malin's age, yeah, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. And, um, oh, they were all to us then back then. We was they? kind of the people that proved that youngsters could go on and catch them fish. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was four years older than Terry. I, was in, yeah. I think I was about 26, 27 when I went on the car park lake. But yeah. That was still considered quite young to be attacking them waters then. And, and since then, as you know now, I mean... I, I had a photographer out of me the other week and he was 20 years old, he'd caught a 50 pounder and he asked me when I caught my first 40 and I said when I was 27 and he looked shocked at me. Yeah, yeah. Different world. That's how it's evolved, isn't Completely it? Completely different world. So much more of it about, isn't there? It's, it's interesting though that you that, that you say what you've just said about the age thing because mm. this was, when, when I was doing my mental prep, I, I'm fortunate with you because I've known of you and have known mm. you for quite a long time so I don't need to do that much prep because mm. we're of the same era growing mm. up. Um, but one of the things I was thinking of was that, you know, uh, again, myself and Simon up in the north doing what mm. we were doing, you guys in the south doing what you were doing, it was the beginning of a new age of the younger anglers coming yeah. through. Mm. And, uh, you know, back then, certainly on those big fish waters, it was mm. an old boys game. Yeah. You know, young anglers, like, suddenly it's like, who are these two young kids mm. that are starting catching fish? Yeah. And you'd got a group on there as well. And I, I I always used to look at some of the the pictures of you. There was what there was Lewis, yeah, uh, Jamie Smith, yeah. uh, yourself, Pinky, uh, yeah. bless him, God rest his soul as well, yeah. Terry, um, mm -hmm. Nick as well. You know, you were the sort of six down south mm -hmm. that that really set the world alight. Really, with like suddenly everyone's looking at these young kids, yeah, as well, they were catching so many big fish. Our generation was sort of inspired on the big fish scene by people like Richard McDonald and yeah. you know the likes and Hutchinson and and then obviously we we sort of hit the 80 caught them big fish proved that younger anglers could do it with that enthusiasm we'd built up over a few years and then you don't realize it at the time but we're actually inspiring the next generation yeah, absolutely and, you know and what come from it and yeah, it's something to be proud of, really. <laughs> yeah. Well, like the photograph, you, you did an interview, I think, with Carpology, was it, or um, uh, Cipru? Who was it? Was, it? was it Elliot that you did the interview with, Probably, or was it Carpology yeah. recently? Where there was a, a few of you talking about the olden days at Yateley. Yeah, seems that to be, was with Cipography, yeah. There, there seems to be um, a, a 90s resurgence at the moment. Everybody's yeah. looking at the 90s and yeah. how good it was, but that's because it was so bloody good. Yeah, yeah. Um, just, just talk to us about some of the stories. What was it like down at Yateley at that time? Because, you know, the iconic picture of... I, I think Richie with Basil in particular mm. is the one that really stands out to me. You know, I, I also, f for me as well, I think Kev Clifford's capture of it mm. was another iconic picture. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are what I call take your breath away pictures. Lots of people have, I say lots, there are a number of esteemed captures of, of Basil. Not yeah. loads and loads, but there's one or two that really stand out. Mm. And and the Richie capture for me was was a huge one. Well, Richie's capture was I think October '84, the year yeah. I left school, and you know it's sort of like all, I was more interested in going fishing when I left school. Yeah. I, I won't lie about it; I didn't really want to get a job or anything. That's all that mattered to me. And then, bang! There's this capture in October. This I think at the time second biggest carp caught in the country, wasn't it? Yeah, Next 46, the, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, 45, was 12. It 40, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know it's. When you set foot on them lakes, you know, I, I was local, lived in Frimley, so I could ride my bike over there as a nipper or, you know, we'd drive over, once we pass a test drive over and have a walk round. It wasn't a very secure venue, you could just wander yeah. about and you'd see these angles. <coughs> I actually met Richie McDonald a couple of times on me wanders, nice yeah. chap. Yeah. Jock White, Terry Pefferbridge, all the Yahoo crew and that lot. Yeah. Almost as a nipper walking round, feared talking to these hardened carp anglers attacking these up rock hard waters that you didn't think you'd ever fish like and but he's quite shocked when that's quite you know pleasant to yeah, you yeah. and then one day you find yourself taking the step over to you you're going on the match lake where you was kind of ushered over to mm. you know like don't you think you should be fishing for 20s lad sort of yeah, thing yeah. all right i'll go and do that yeah caught all them moved on to the cops lake trying to catch a few target 30s done that Right, I'm coming over to the big fish side now, you know. But when you set foot on them lakes, you're a little bit in fear of it. You, you know, you think, God, well, these iconic fish that, you know, Richie Mack and Robin Dix, like another iconic shot yeah, of heaven, yeah, wasn't it? Robin yeah, Dix's absolutely. capture. 
you're thinking, I'd love to catch them fish, like beyond your wildest dreams and that, and how long is this going to take? And you think you're going to be sitting it out for 10 years on them lakes because you hear all the stories, you know, so-and-so went on there, he looked Basil or he looked ever on his first night and he lost it at a net or something and he's still on there six yeah. years later, you yeah. know, that's what you're facing, you know, and yeah, there, there's a bit of nervousness about it, but he's also had confidence from being successful elsewhere, like venues before and the, the slightly, say, lesser lakes on the other side of the road, you yeah, know. But yeah, yeah. But yeah he's, it's quite shocking to be sat there thinking, I'm fishing for them fish I see 10 years ago in the papers, like, you know. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting about the, you know, the photographs. You talk about the, the, the photographs of, of Richie. There was there was one for me that really set me alight, mm. and that was Rod Hutchinson at Cassian. With, mm. uh, he got a 56-pounder on a lilo. I don't know if you yeah, know that. Yeah, but I remember that. In picture, exactly yeah. the same way that Richie inspired you to do mm. that. I was, I think I was 15, maybe 16 at the time mm. when Rod caught that. And that just turned me on immediately to mm. continental fishing. I thought, as soon yeah. as I can drive, I'm going there. Didn't yeah, even know wow. where it was. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I just want yeah. that. It was, a, it was amazing. <laughs> well, on the subject of particularly good fish, we ask people to bring in a present for us that we can stick on our fantastic wall of memorabilia. We've got some lovely things up here. And Sharpie, you've got something for us as well. And I think it is a fish, but it's a very, very special one, isn't it? Just tell us what this is well, and it's... why you've bought it in. It's quite fitting, really. It's sort of, um, I don't know, one of the things I'm famed for and probably my most epic capture and a picture of the Burfield Common there. There it is. Look it, at that. that I is even signed it for you. Fantastic. <laughs> we should get that framed. We'll just show this camera over here. Anyway. So we shall get that framed and stick it on our wall of fame up there. You'll be in esteemed company with... Uh, with some of the things that we got up there, but that is a, a very, very, very special capture indeed. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorted. Lovely. Very carpy T-shirt on that one as well. I've still got it. <laughs> I have an <laughs> fashionista. <laughs> Probably don't fit me now though. I'm about three stone heavier. <laughs> <laughs> there's one really iconic picture. There's a number of iconic pictures of you, but there's one particularly iconic picture of you that that stands out for for me. And I think it was Heather. Mm. You got your optics cormorants. That's on. right. Yeah. So the old glasses. Yeah. And I just thought at the time you were the coolest man in carp fish. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever yeah. told you that, but I just thought at the time, yeah, man, he's he's proper cool. There's the old um, burgundy um, airborne yeah. sweatshirt as well. That yeah. Was so happened to end up in all my big fish shots at Yateley as well. You know that. I think even some of the clothing brands these days sell burgundy sweatshirts yeah, on off the back, the back of, that. of it. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. You, but you've got to say that, you know, as as fashionistas, mm. both both you and Terry at that time, yeah. some of those pictures, you know, the, the uh, iconic clothing items. Let's have a look at what the most iconic clothing item is. Going back historically, Dick Walker's felt hat. Mm. That's got to be up there quite <laughs> a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Rod Hutchinson had a multicoloured sun visor. That's right. Yeah, that I one? remember that. Yeah, um, it looked like he'd been playing tennis. Or that's something. it. Yeah, it's like where on earth does that come from? Yeah. But it just looked completely yeah. wrong, didn't it? Um, then you look at um, with with Terry. I think the cardigan stood out quite a lot. Yeah, the cardigan that was. I think we went up um, Blackbush Market just up the road from Yatey on, on a Sunday market, and yeah. I think he bought that cardigan there, and it just. God only knows what happened to that card. He's probably still got it. He's now, always Terry, in, in his got it. He doesn't throw anything away. <laughs> but yeah, it, you know, I think actually yesterday I see on uh, a Facebook group, I think it's Old School Carpers. I don't know if you follow it. Yeah, there's yeah. A pic someone yeah. had posted a picture up that I took with um, Terry Old in a dustbin up wearing that card. Was it really? And, yeah. you know, everyone's going mad about that picture. And it kind of makes me proud to have taken that yeah. picture. But it is of that time, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but again, like you say, your jumper. Yeah, I mean, I was given that by a mate who was in the parachute yeah. regiment, and he told me never to wear it and we'll let anyone see you wear it. And, yeah, yeah. Because paratroopers don't yeah. like to see you wearing yeah, things yeah. like that. And I did actually have one pull me up, like, sort of come into me swim at Yate. You, when was you in then? Yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, like this big 16 stone man mountain. Yeah. And I said, well, I wasn't. My, my mate gave me it. So yeah, and right, he's yeah, like, you're not meant to wear that. And I was in there for 22 years. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. It's my lucky jumper, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. But yeah, he's a, 
I'd never thought I'd become a fashion icon, though, yeah. in fishing with well, my glasses I mean, look at and the now, jumper. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it was just so cool. Mm. In the, at the time, it was so cool. And, you know, the, the other thing that, uh, at the time that was quite big was the, the, the clubbing scene as well, mm. wasn't it? You know, I know Lockie was into it as well. I yeah. don't think he, was, he wasn't fishing Yately at that time. He was probably around Dartford somewhere. Mm. But, you know, the, 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 the music scene went hand in hand very much. Yeah, it did. I mean, around... Like my era, late eighties, early nineties, you had the illegal rave scene and that, which yeah. was great fun. And then it became legal, and I kind of backed out of all of that sort of early nineties, ninety three, ninety four. As, yeah. as the more focused I got on Yately, the less I was interested in it all. But obviously, the music was there, and locally, it was um, there was friends of mine actually. Yeah. They run a pirate radio station called Radioactive. I think Terry wrote about right. it in his book, and yeah, that we yeah. all tuned in i think we uh, on the pads lake and that there was a, a tree down on grebes head point and we got a bit of copper wire and climbed the tree and wrapped it around it and then you wrapped it around the area of your little radio yeah. and so you could yeah. tune so into tune it in a bit more but yeah was, you could walk into a few swims and everyone would be listening to the you know yeah. music <laughs> on the little radios and that uh, it was part of it back then. I mean, yeah. now I think everyone listens to opera music when they're fishing, don't they? Yeah, well, so. I don't know because if you look at if you look at Alan Blair and the Nash Boys, they yeah. you know they're sort of they yeah quite they're music all into it and well, yeah, they, they like all so. their decks and that side of things, don't they? It's, yeah, yeah. I suppose it's. It's each to their own, isn't it? You yeah. know? It's, it's funny because you get people now going, "Oh God, the music! Oh, they shouldn't be doing that." It's all yeah. about. But actually, thirty years ago, it's what we were doing anyway. Yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm from the north, well, North Midlands, North West Midlands. And you know the, the whilst we were into house music, the, mm. the the Manchester tunes were ours. So you know yeah. the Stone Roses and, yeah, and yeah. all of that. This is well mm. pre Oasis, mm. but they were such a huge part of yeah. uh, of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, just sticking on Yately before we move elsewhere, uh, the Basil Stone. The Basil Stone. Let's yeah. talk about the Basil Stone. For those of you that don't know what the Basil Stone is, you're going to find out because this is an incredible piece of history. Is it is it still around, or was that buried with Basil? This is a hard question. I couldn't give you a straight answer on that, but I know there was a stone that got passed round. That if, I don't know how, but this stone was passed from one to the other, and if someone caught Basil and they in possession of the stone, they handed it on to the next person. That's it. It was. And, uh, I, 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 I thought you might know where it originally came from. Basically, what it was was there was a it was a tiny pebble. It was only like mm. as big as a two pence piece, yeah. wasn't it? Maybe even smaller. Yeah. Because I know Terry had it at one stage. Yeah, yeah. I think. And and basically, this was a lucky thing. So someone caught Basil, and I, I'd like to know who where the original came from. Maybe Terry knows. Terry, <laughs> if you're watching, let us know. Yeah. Um, but they 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 drew a picture of the fish on the on the stone. And then it got passed around, hmm. and if you caught it, then you gave it to someone else. That you that's was, right. Was yeah. Jump. Did you? I thought you had it. At no, one stage. I never had the basil stone myself. Did you know? But you had basil. Yeah. 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 So I think I probably caught it too quickly to be handed the stone. So right. Yeah. Maybe someone who was holding the stone was still holding it after I'd been and gone. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was only on the North Lake twenty six nights. So. Oh well, there, I've been there, done that. Piece <laughs> yeah. of cake. Hey? Tick the box. Tick gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, just before we move off, Yately, then, uh, of all of those fish, you know, dustbin, orange, heather, basil, which would you put as your highest of those? Would it be basil or heather, do you think? Tricky question, two different carp, aren't they? Yeah. One a lever and one a, you know, a mirror carp. Um, I've lever carp are very rare. Yeah. Heather was my first 40, so very special there, but. I think basil is just such an iconic just, fish. Um, I've even named one of my cats basil, so it probably is that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, to, to to catch one of those fish is incredible, mm. but to have caught two of them is, is amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Let's roll the clock forwards uh, and talk about more iconic carp as well, because that's not the end of the story there, is it? No. Um, there's a certain common that lives in a place called Burfield mm. that is arguably the most sought-after fish in the country uh, as well, and you've uh, you've managed to peg that one too. Yeah, that was, well, going back a few years now, 2006, May 2006, I caught that. After pretty much five years to the day of going after it, I originally went to Burfield because I wanted to catch a 40 pound common. Yeah. As we just said, I'd caught a lever and a few, couple of mirrors over 40 pounds. And I thought, I'm not one for breaking any records. Or, you know, like I, I looked at sort of uh, Raysbury and it was full of record hunters back after Terry had caught with boats and that. And I thought, oh, well out of my depth, I'm a 
at the time relatively small gravel pit angler that's a little bit out of my league and working full time couldn't do it so I thought I set my own little records like you said you you know you fish for a weight I set myself little targets and I thought you know what I wouldn't mind mirror common and leather you know, yeah. like, and at the time I think there was probably only three or four 40 plus commons in the country and two of them were open access waters one being Burfield and one being um Sutton yeah. and you know Sutton was down Dartford way wrong side of the M25 <laughs> yeah and you know Burfield sort of 18 20 miles from where I lived in Camby at the time so that was a uh, you know that's where I'm going next sort of thing you know and I, I went there originally just to catch 40 pound common because I'd heard a 41 pounder had been caught the year before and see it in the angling times and yeah pretty much found it straight away from walking on the lake and then you know need that got it taking mixes nearly you know was very close to catching it within the first couple of days and you know i thought you know i like this place there's other fish seeing them swimming about and enjoying catching a few fish with me mate bidders and uh, i think we had that year we caught 40 fish between us from burfield which which was pretty good when we was learning it for ourselves we didn't ask questions or anything i did have a few mates from old we were old school and very secretive so i didn't even dare ask them but so were there, was there many people on it then was it was it busy Burfield was back then there's just a few local anglers and another chap called Chris Gardner fishing it yeah. and the local anglers it was their back garden their playground yeah. and um you kind of like they didn't welcome you I wouldn't say they were that hostile unusual well <laughs> it's like I know why now because those lads are all very good friends of mine known yeah. for 20 odd years and that but the reason why they didn't befriend you is because they did see people come and go and they didn't want to encourage you. Yeah, but yeah. After, once they realised that me and Bidders had caught sort of several fish between us that year that we weren't going anywhere. And yeah. in the end, the sort of leader of the pack, Stuart, like, you know, he's, he'd been on there years anyway. He, he sort of stopped one. You know, he used to walk through me swim. Some yeah. of us, you know, you'd be bivvied up on a path with your rods in the reeds and they'd have to walk past the front of you and he'd walk through with his rods and his rucksack on his back and he wouldn't even say hello or anything. And, yeah. you know, this went on from May till September and then one day in September he just stopped and said, you know, you've seen it then? Or, yeah. Mm. He's, yeah, you ain't going anywhere, are you, mate? I said, no, I'm here till I catch it. And he yeah, said, yeah. oh, he goes, right, I'll start off, I'll apologise for not speaking to you but i see so many people come and go like and yeah. i can see you're not going to give up so I'm like, right yeah. very good friends to this day join the game but that's what them lakes not just burfield mm -hmm. you had engerfield and farnham flynn and that they was all very quiet lakes they were the locals back garden their playground mm -hmm. and now it's a different story very popular pingewood was fished a bit mm -hmm. i think chili and laney and all that lot was over there because yeah. they was fishing the for the jockey there, back then yeah. you know i was like I, I remember when i was sort of recce and burfield out that winter when all that you know chili and you know ian yeah. russell and laney and all that lot was over oh you remember you used to be driving past think no they don't see my car because yeah, i don't yeah. want them to know where i'm going and what i'm up to you know but um yeah it's it's, it's evolved in the last 20 years my i think um my time chap called Malcolm Tab caught the common on my first year, 45-12. Good weight gain for it. That created a bit of interest the following year. It yeah. did get busier. And then that influx of anglers slowly died off like over the next two or three years. And it, I think people started to think, forget about it or think mm -hmm. I was after this mythical thing that's in my imagination and that. And then obviously in that day in 2006 when I caught it, it's like, boom mm. you know 50 pounder so like very big fish for its time as well so and, it really and common it it, it it changed the dynamic in that mm. not not in that area but certainly on that lake mm. that 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 went from being you know for those out of the area it's sort of rumored that there is a reasonable fish in there mm. and yeah there's a 45 in there to suddenly right it's a 50 pound common mm. and 50 pound commons are huge yeah. mm. you know a 50 pound fish was massive but a 50 pound common in particular was you know well, and it sort of it it sort of shone the spotlight on it then a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I remember reading something that Paisley had wrote about, you know, we have record mirrors and record commons in Europe. Why don't we have a record common in England? And yeah. he said my capture should have been the record common at the time. But yeah. it's like, which is, 
you know, that's like quite nice for someone <laughs> like yeah, Sim yeah. to have said about that, you know. And but yeah, it did create a lot of interest. I think the I messaged Ian Welsh because he was always very good, the angling yeah. manager for CMX or RMC at the time. He, he's always very good to me, so I let him know, and he posted something up on their forum. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that forum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm told because once I caught the comment, we done the photos. I had a cup of tea, packed my gear up, and went. That's yeah. me done. <laughs> like, it's quite funny. Five years just for that moment gone. Yeah. But I'm told the following day after it, the car parks around there were just rammed with people wanting to have a look around and all that. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like, wow, what have it's, I done? It's, <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Uh, you know, you're 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 very much old school. And mm. reading about, I think I don't know whether it's Rob Malin and the boys that started it. But when you've caught the biggest fish in the lake, you pull off. Yeah, you don't yeah. wade through them. If your target is the biggest fish in the lake. And I sort of subscribe to that as well, I think. That, that kind of comes from um, your Yately days. Like. Was it Yately then? So, yeah. you know, like, say for instance, the North Lake only had seven m main fish in it. And when you're talking seven fish, you had Basil, which was a 40 pounder, which, yeah. let's face it, that's what everyone comes to catch. Yeah. They didn't travel from Manchester, the other side of Kent, the West Country, yeah. to come and catch the 30 or the 20s. Yeah. They come for Basil. Now, yeah, we had Basil, the 30. I think you had four 20s yeah. and a couple of doubles. That was the stock of the lake. So you catch Basil. Mm. You, there's no rule, but out of respect for the other anglers who are doing the travelling and putting the time in, you pull off because yeah. you don't want to catch it again. You don't become a dream breaker. Yeah. Uh, I think there's only ever one angler that caught Basil twice. Yeah. Uh, I think he's not palsy or something like that is a robin dixie's mate yeah, i think yeah. he caught it at a low weight and as a 40 pounder yeah that's historic i think basil done 60 captures but yeah the thing was pull off yeah. and if you did go back on there you was frowned upon yeah, yeah. now there are several lakes like that still about low stock water small family of carp with one main target and the gentleman's agreement with the red card as they call it yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you go and realistically what you're trying to prove by staying on there you just become a dream breaker don't you yeah, yeah, yeah. nowadays some people try and pull the red card on what i call super waters that have multiple stocks of big fish yeah. you know and um say like there's 20 odd 40s in a lake and you go on there and catch the big one on your first fish yeah. you spent whatever these days prices are inflated thousand pound ticket yeah, you've not what you do you drop there. it yeah so people tend to stay on and try and catch some of the other fish because you've bought into that syndicate or whatever for say the 20 40s not just the one yeah bit, bit like you saying you fish for the number of yeah. you know the size of fish you think right i want to go there because that's got 20 40s in it yeah and yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a hard one to pull the red card thing i mean yeah the red card is a circuit water saying isn't it so, yeah yeah you know. it's a, it is a, it is a tricky one that you know the gentlemanly side of mm. things is quite nice mm. but like you say i think the the difference then is the stock yeah that you know if it's if it's one standout mm. and and low stock then yeah, yeah fair enough fair maybe enough. i'm being romantic i don't, I, I don't no. know i i i had a i had a love affair with cassian for a, a, a very mm. long time Mm. Uh, and I went down it and I just fished it because I loved it mm. I don't know if you've ever been but it's just no, amazing no I've not no it, I it, remember it, reading about it over the years from the early days of Hutchinson even Richie Mack went there didn't he so. yeah it was mm. it was just you know it was it was mecca it mm. was very special mm. and you know where where Yeatley and Raysbury were the heart of UK fishing mm. then then Cassie was the heart of continental fishing mm. And, you know, I went over that and I was lucky enough in, I think it was 2016, I caught the biggest fish in the lake. It was one of the last wow. originals still mm. in there, the, a, a fish called Bernadette. Yeah. Um, and, and immediately sort of my dynamic changed with the place a little mm. bit. It wasn't, I don't know if you feel the same way, but it's almost like, yeah, I've done it now. Yeah. Um, and I've been back a couple of times, but I don't fish it in the same way. No, now. I mean, I've had it myself with some waters, like what I call super waters. That yeah. You do catch the big one say like at Frimley with the Charlie's yeah, mate, Charlie's for, mate. Yeah. for instance I caught that as um, funnily enough I didn't catch the Burfield Common as my first 40 common I caught Charlie's mate in 2003 or something 41 pound there was, yeah, still yeah, wasn't yeah. many 40 pound commons back then but then I, I went back there several years later like when the ownership of the place changed and I'm, I actually recaptured Charlie's mate at 50 pounds 8 yeah. like you're talking probably 17 years between captures. Yeah. It's, it's nice to see the old girl again, 
but there's a different buzz recapturing it yeah, you know yeah. it's yeah. it's but i was more for fishing for some of the others like your your black eye and uh what's the other one gregory like yeah. that was one yeah. i really wanted to catch out of there you know but that place has evolved in time there was a lot of big fish in there you know i think now something like three different 50 pound commons wow. in there at the right time of year you know yeah, yeah, and yeah again where do you draw the line with it you know it's like it's surprising <laughs> actually when you when you've caught one how you feel an affinity to it you, mm. you know you want you want it but once you've yeah. caught it you almost feel like it's a friend yeah don't yeah. you and 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 if you do have a recapture of it it's like oh hello again yeah i mean and do you talk to him i talk to him oh you have your little muttering moments don't you i mean it's it's like again we'll always end up talking about yately because it's so special yeah. now the north lake the low stock you look at it i, I can't remember 12 islands of spit you know bays and it's quite a daunting lake when you thought there's only like a handful of carp here yeah. where are they this is a bit of a maze you know i fished a lot bigger mazes since like 100 acre burfield maze yeah. sort of thing but yeah you're kind of like fishing it trying to work it all out trying to get in touch you see a fish you move and that lot and um but it's so mad the moment when you you know like you lift the net round basil and, you know gazing down there you have your little moment wow richard mcdonald caught this so and so's caught this you know the history of it all you see your hooking its mouth and that yeah. but then once your photos and everything's done and it's swum off and a few people depart and you start packing your gear up you stand there and you look at the lake you think i'll work that out yeah it almost seems like it's it's simple like the mystery's gone from it doesn't it and yeah yeah, it's uh, recaptures. There's never the same buzz from it, is there? Doesn't matter if they're bigger or not. No, I don't think so. I, I, it's it, it's funny when you like. I don't I don't spend a lot of time on the same waters. Mm. I tend to I yeah. tend to bump around quite a lot just because of the nature of mm. work, and it's always been thus really. Mm. Um, but I used to be a member of Birch Grove. You know, mm. late nineties, early mm -hmm. early two thousands, um, and that for me at the time was arguably it was it was one of the best winter waters yeah. in the country. You know, we yeah, had a yeah. winter syndicate November through to March. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of thirty pounders back then. You know, thirty pounders were big fish. Uh, there wasn't a forty in there, mm. um, and it was interesting because there's as there always is there was an A team of I don't know five or six big mm. fish in there, and I mm. I can't remember. I think I did three winters on there. I can't mm. remember having recaptures. No. And actually ended up working the way all the way through, but that's not good. having a recapture. <laughs> no, that's very good. You know, and it's 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 weird, isn't it? You know, yeah. whether or not they're learning, or whether whether when you've done something, do you? Let, let me pose this one: when you're on a lake that you're fishing regularly, as opposed to bouncing around, are you doing the same thing in the same swim? So you know you've got the point swim and you know that 60 yards out there is a bar and you've mm. caught a couple of fish off that bar. Yeah. When you've caught them on there, do you keep revisiting that bar or do you go mm. somewhere else? You tend to... Um, I've been very guilty of it before and it, it's a tricky one. Sometimes on a, a lake that's not so busy and you can pre-bait and work a swim, you will keep revisiting them swims and you'll yeah. milk it for every bite and create a playpen or a feeding yes. area you know everything will come to you sort of thing obviously on busier lakes like lakes and now nowadays are a lot busier you know you get rules where you're not allowed to pre-bait and things like that so i consider being out of getting a swim two or three weeks on a trot yeah. a right result and Absolutely. you kind of rely on that former sessions as pre-baiting don't you yeah yeah and yeah. You do find yourself getting into that, and I've found myself in recent years sometimes I think that's been to, to my detriment. Because you, you know, recapture like, the same because, fish because yeah, the creature I, rabbits. I, they literally, yeah. you think, right, I need to be in, you know, that swim, you know, say, like you say, the point on yeah. in May because the weed's up, and you go in there and you know you're going to get bites, you do get bites, and oh God, it's that one again, yeah. you know. And this year I kind of changed my tact. I'm not fishing any swims that i fished before because of that because yeah. i don't really want to keep capturing the same fish but again i did have a recapture of a big fish this year but yeah, yeah. it kind of got in the way of what i was after so but you yeah. you, you sort of i, I don't know I, I i think these things are so often creatures of habit mm. you know I, I remember me and crowley fishing at um orchid and dorchester mm. you know yeah. on the on the lagoon there and um crowley preferred orchid Mm. Um, you know, it was slightly more of a pressured water. I've always mm. liked the slightly wilder, bigger waters mm. that, that didn't have as much pressure on. So mm. I like the Dorchester side. Right. And I remember going down and 
there was a there was a thirty seven pound common in there, which again, mm. you know, at that time was absolutely massive, and it was a it was a big lake, it was forty forty odd acres. Mm. So you know, it's not it's not a small, not huge, but not mm. small. And this fella caught it, and then he came back on his birthday because he caught it on his birthday, and he came mm. back the following year on his birthday, and just like for old time's sake, mm. I'm coming back, fish the same peg, caught at the same fish on the same day under the same tree and <laughs> that's that's always stuck with me yeah they, these things do happen yeah. don't they <laughs> basil's bush yeah you know why was it called basil's bush well it did get caught there a few so, times didn't it and yeah. i think i can remember one i can't remember the angler but they actually might have been jock white or something called the snake twice out yeah. of the corral on exactly the same day the following year and you know it's, yeah yeah, it, it happens these too things much. do happen, you know. Yeah. I, I know some anglers that do fish off a calendar like that. Oh, so and so fish was caught out of that swim off that spot on this day last year, and they'll be in there, you know. Yeah, I've yeah, actually put yeah. myself in areas like that, but there's, like you say, masters their own environment. There's a reason why certain areas of the lake attract carp at certain times of the year, and whether it's the weed coverage, the natural food, or anything, it's absolutely it's all absolutely. part of the bigger picture. Talk to me about the capture of the Burfield Common. How did you actually catch it? Well, again, my great memory of seeing it feeding in certain areas over the years I was on there, and but the actual build up to that capture started at the end of april when i was circuiting the lake on my bike yeah because it was faster to get around it on a bike and look at different areas but um i'd opted to fish down the shallow end but a friend of mine alan welsh was fishing in the first shallow swim and rather than go opposite him on the blue pool side yeah i sort of fished slightly off the shallows in a swim called the blocks i think it was and the reason i wanted to be there as while i was chatting to alan i see a bit of bubbling out in the shallows yeah. and you know, it's like, yeah, I'd really like to go at them, but he is, leave him to it, you know, with yeah. respect. It's 100 acres. You don't sit up next to someone on an empty 100-acre pit, yeah. do you? No. you? You give them a bit of space, etiquette, you yeah. know, it's that yeah. word that we all use. But, some, you know, actually practising etiquette. And I remember the next morning I got up and I wandered just up the bank. I was feeling a little bit tired because I watched me water for a bit, yeah. just drinking a couple of cups of tea, but I was feeling a bit tired, but... I, I decided to make a coffee and I wandered up the bank. Now, I don't often drink coffee, but I believe that cup of coffee, I still remember it to this day, was the reason that bit the build-up started. But I needed something to keep me awake. And I remember walking up the bank with it and I was looking across the shallows towards Alan, scanning the area where I'd seen the bubbles from his swim. And um, there was bubbles pinging to the surface in that area. And literally, while I stood there watching it and sipping my coffee, I see a big fish come out like it literally showed itself bosh and i was like wow that was it wasn't it and literally as i was thinking that was it it's come up again and then again and it sort of showed three different ways it didn't come the same sort of way it's yeah. sort of that way that way that. It's so almost it's like here i am you know yeah. showing itself so and you know that that's the burfield common at the time yeah well I was thinking, there's no mistake there's no other big at the time when i fished burfield there was probably five other fish over 30 pound in that lake right. You know, and Nothing I'm talking low so no, You know, that's a one-off. It's that's a, hugely I used exciting. to call it a freak of nature. Terry said it's a wonder of nature, yeah, which yeah. I think Terry is probably a bit more just in saying. Yeah. But um, it's like, I remember a bit later on, I was sort of, well, I need to get, you know, I'm going to have to go in now. I'm not going to cast long now. I'll cast a bit short because yeah. I'm, I'm not casting on top of Al. He wasn't fishing fully on it. Yeah. He'd clearly see this fish as well. And... It's quite, it's all part of the story, but me and our good friends, we never spoke about the fishing on the lake. It's kind yeah. of a, an agreement between us. We shared the sailing club, like as our sort of lodge, and yeah. where our freezers and everything was. But um, I remember moving in there opposite him and I just put some bright ones on chod rigs. I think yeah. I spoke to Dave Lane on the phone the day before us, so asked, you know, what was it? You know, when I cast them out, I said, um, you know, I've just stuck a toot in a pineapple. And he's going, oh, do you think they'll have that? I said, well, you know, I've caught them out of here before. Like, yeah. why not? You know, I'll stick them out for the day and put yeah. some food baits out for the night. And, yeah, put the rods out, sort of whipped them in in the evening, put some food baits on, scattered a little bit of bait out. I think the next morning I woke up to a 26 pound. I thought, right, I've got the rigs right, everything in the area. Just got to keep focusing on it. And I think over the next three weeks, I see a couple of instances of the water moving like someone waddling plank yeah. you know over a bar in the shallows um i'd caught a couple of other fish as well and i just 
if I was either in the swim that I'd caught the first one from where I'd seen it show or opposite where I was fishing he, he for some reason was fishing elsewhere on the lake yeah he, he, and which is like I don't know whether he realized what at the time sort of thing but I just kept you know keep going in that area throwing sticking bait around that sense where you could hit it from both sides and um yeah it, the build up was the session I think I set up, the wind went up the other end, I moved up the other end, and the wind sort of turned around, it came back down, so I went back round to the original swim I see it show from, the following morning, caught the classic carp. Now that fish has been caught several times, well, not several times, it had history of Dan caught it with a common. Yeah. You catch that fish, the common's about, and I remember I stood in the blocks talking to my mate John when I had the take off that, and I've heard a bleep, it's locked up, yeah. fishing tight clutch with chods, it's bit of a tip fish tight clutches on chods because you want the lead to pull up mm. to the up link on the take yeah. uh, um i remember just seeing a bow wave leave the area and another one go the other way so i thought what else yeah. was when i got it in like it's classic yeah. what else was there it could be it you know that was a big bow wave left the spot and that was a repeat capture you got to keep going through them again and again get the rods back out i think the next morning woke up to the double belly which was the mm. biggest mirror in the lake 34 yeah. pound yeah Wow, I'm close here, and I couldn't recast the rod because there was scum all over the surface. I needed southwesterly to blow it all away. Yeah. And, um, when the wind picked up and the water ski boat come out, it cleared. You know, so I whipped the rod back out. I'd actually had to put a bigger hook on because I'd run out of size fives at the time, so I put a size four on. Yeah. Cast, you know, checked it in the margins, cast it out, and then at midday while I was dozing on my bed chair, because because of the two fish I'd caught, I think I was four days into the session, I thought, I need to hold this swim because yeah. I'm close. Yeah. <laughs> How you think that after five years of ploughing your way through the fish again and again, but I was thinking, I think I had a little bit of water. I thought, the only way I can survive until it's dark is I need to go to sleep and preserve my water yeah. and then I'll nip home and get some provisions to stay in the swim. And literally I was dozing on my bed chair and them two previous fish hadn't, taken line off the clutch I just pinged it out of the clip yeah. and I woke up to a one noter and I kind of knew I didn't yeah, even yeah. put my trainers on or anything I just bent into this fish and yeah. very Here powerful we go. Like, Here we go. Yeah. yeah like playing a conger and epic battle involving steering it from two islands and it snagging me in the bushes and margins big explosions and that and there she was in my net you know job done <laughs> yeah. incredible know. yeah and the feeling when it you know when when your target Mm. Whatever your target is, goes over that net cord. Yeah, yeah. is just. I, I I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's a good one, but for me, um, it's actually relief yeah. first and foremost. You don't get the elation. You get you get a squirt of elation, like mm. yes. It's like oh, thank for that, mm. don't you? Yeah. yeah. That, that you know, at last I've got it, or you know, you've you've hit the target, whatever it might be. I remember during the battle when I got it on a shorter line and it was kiting to me right and I knew there's a snag bush to the right yeah and I was just winding like trusting me tackle giving it everything and I remember thinking don't go in that bush don't go in that bush and it did <laughs> right but I remember as it come past me your mind's racing and you know it's everything goes into slow motion because you're thinking quickly isn't there? yeah and I remember just seeing it per perfectly as if it was out of the water in front of me that is it this is your chance it's yeah. on like you know do not yeah <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely. that sort of thing and uh you well, know that, it's like i was talking myself don't move your foot in keep your feet where they are that you yeah. know don't like once it's in the bush just you know it's rolling about fortunately it yeah. was well up chod rig and the lead was in its mouth so nothing would hang up sort yeah. of thing you know but, yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, so this the psychology of big fish angling is one thing. The psychology of playing a big fish mm. is another thing as well, isn't it? I, I, I don't know if this is just me, and I'll, I'll throw this out. I've never spoken to anybody about this at all, at all, but I think sometimes you can talk the fish off in your own mind, and sometimes you can keep it on in your own yeah, mind. Yeah. And there's a huge amount of positive mental attitude mm. when you're playing that big fish. You know when the fight has gone on for just that little bit longer mm. than you want it to? You think, oh, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Oh, yeah, it's a good fish. And you think, right, now is time. Yeah. And then you see it and it buggers off another 20 yards back out again. You think, oh, God, <laughs> yeah. it's going to come off. Yeah. And there's been a few times where I think it's going to come off. It's going to come off. It's going to come off. Mm. And guess what? It's come off. And, and it, you know, it can't be because I was thinking it was going to come off that mm. it's actually come off. 
But there's other times you think, right, you're now, you're not coming off. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's mindset or what, but, the, you know, I'd, I'd a good one recently. And, and again, it was a it was a huge fight. You know, one mm. of those, the unstoppable run, the the, the big mm. scrap, all of this lock. It's gone into some reads. I just thought, oh, this is going to come off. And then I just thought, no, don't think like that. It's mm. definitely not going to come off. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes you can talk it off in your own mind. Sometimes. Yeah, you can do. I mean, I'm a bit boring when it comes to rigs. I use the same old rigs I've used for yep. years. And, you know, they're fine-tuned and that. And I know how much stick I can give them. General rule is, you know, say hinge stiff rig, one of my favourites, or yeah. a chog rig. If they stay on more than 10 seconds, they're coming in. Yeah. yeah. Unless yeah. you hit snags or, you yeah. know, like pad stems or whatever, you know. But... There's different ways of playing fish in different situations, yeah, isn't there? You know, so. Like, uh, well, again, I was I was talking to a fellow the other day about um, hook patterns. I don't think there's a bad hook pattern out there. I think all of the no. hooks, you know, there's very rarely a bad hook, yeah. but I do think there are certain hook patterns that don't suit certain people's playing styles, whether very that's true. the setup or not. Very true. You know, and people turn around and go, "Oh, Nash hooks are crap," or "Fox hooks are crap," or whatever hooks are crap. It's like, no, actually, they're not. They just mm. don't suit your playing style yeah. because of the setup you've yeah. got, or or the certain you know, knots you use to tie the hooks, or any any of the fine tuning of it and it? absolutely it's like small margins add up don't yeah. they and I, and I think this is perhaps being slightly more old school when you've got something you know you say you're fairly mm. boring with your rigs actually you're not boring at all because mm. you know what works yeah and i bet you haven't changed your hooks for god knows how long or you haven't changed your rigs for, for lord knows how long i have, experiment you know, but these days like say years ago when you know the hinge rig start came out everyone was on and boily hooks and yeah. that lot. Now I've never really liked boily hooks. I used to lose fish on them. Yeah, maybe like you say, it didn't style. suit my playing style or what yeah. have you. But everyone was on them. I prefer a straight pointed hook. So yeah. I used to get a super specialist and slowly bend the eye out slightly on them, the same yeah. as like the boily hook had the outturned back eye. Then it evolves almost a crossover of them to like a super specialist and a boily hook yeah. evolved into a stiff rigger, the yeah. ESP stiff rigger. And now I don't think there's a tack terminal tackle company out there that doesn't do what's now called a chod hook, which yes. evolved from a stiff rigger sort of yeah, thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. And let's face it, most are good, aren't they? I've used pretty much most of them. Yeah. There's a fashion these days that hooks have micro barbs, and micro barbs mm. are getting so small they might as well not be a barb. Mm. So, you know, it's like, again... What do you do about that? Do you play them harder? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I think... I think you just know, mm. don't you? You know, yeah. you know very quickly. I know what hooks work for me, mm -hmm. uh, and I know what hooks don't work for me. Mm. And 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 sometimes, for some reason, I, I don't know why, I might be swayed. And and this isn't targeting fish. This is just going fishing. So I might be swayed to try something else for a reason. You know straight away whether or not it's it's right mm. or wrong. Yeah. Uh, and and I think when you've when you've been around the track a little bit, it's very hard to pry yeah. you off what you've done. It's not we're boring. We just know what works. Yeah. But talking about what works, big fish bait. Do you believe that there is bait that can target big fish, or do you just think that carp will eat anything? I used to think that. I mean, spin the clock back again, we go back to Yateley, yeah. right? Now, when I went to Yateley, from the Match Lake right through to Cops, Car Park, North Lake, Pads Lake, caught them all, and I caught them all fairly quickly. I think yeah. the longest campaign was Pads Lake, five months it took me to catch that one out of there. But generally on the Match Lake and the Cops Lake, I caught the better fish. I yeah. didn't catch the smaller ones, but I used fish mill baits now. Yeah. I owe this to the likes of Terry Pethbridge from the old Yahoo crew. Like yeah. they, you know, me and my mates, like Maggot and Paul Toy, like we used to use bird food baits. We used, to, I think, I forget, who, I think we used to get it off a bloke called uh, Rob McGill, an old 80 veteran. Yeah. And it used to be called the 80 It Squad mix, like a bird food bait. And we did all right on that. It's a good bait. It caught a lot of good fish. And, um, but when we got talking to Terry Pethbridge as youngsters and told him we was fishing like a 60 acre lake with 16 fish in it, yeah. it's like um, Hawley Lake, um, he was interested because they were old leanies and, yeah. and he's like, you know, he's like a bit, I don't know, bold sort of bloke, you know, like you want to get on a fish mill for his like premier fish mills yeah, and, yeah. you know, put, you know, cap full to each egg in it and cap full to each egg on it like glug them up with fish oils get them out there and we we caught all them fish in a couple of weeks once we started using fish mills and this sort of carried on through me fishing you know when you yeah. find something that works like you've been doing all right but then all of a sudden it accelerates yeah. you know you think you stick with that and that worked into Yateley a few years later and i went through them and 
funnily enough, when I met Terry, he used to use like a bird food or a nut meal bait. Yes. And Terry, for instance, I caught 15 fish out of the match lake that year. Terry caught 40 carp from the match lake and the cops lake just doing afternoon sessions and stalking. But yeah. he tended to catch the smaller ones. He struggled to get through them and like into the bigger ones. I wouldn't say Terry struggled because he yeah. never struggled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember when he went over to the North Lake to hunt basil, like he was still using that same sort of bait. And I remember him asking me about it. And at the time... Jeff Pink had sorted me and Terry out a deal with Nashi, yes. like, and I'd moved on from Premier and Cotswold baits. So I'd moved on to like um, Nash Monster Pursuit because yeah. I looked through what Nashi did. He had the Sting. Yeah. And I know Tench like that for some reason, so I thought I'll go for this Monster Pursuit. That worked well on the Cops Lake, caught the big ones quick out of there, and then Terry's like, on you know that bait you're using, and I don't know if you remember the myth that. Yeah. Um, Basil used to like a bait with Robin Red in it, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. So Terry got hold of the Monster Pursuit, and I think he introduced Robin Red to it, or he might have mixed it with a sting to give it yeah. that red tinge. Yeah. And it, you know, straight away he started catching. I don't know what fl- I think he used Cajun prawn and shellfish sensibil as his flavours. Yeah. I was using lobster thermidor and salmon oil palate. And, yeah. You know, and, and I think regular sensibil at the time. But um, again, I just carried on catch the big fish car part like you know heather's my first bite single scale's my second bite the big commons my third bite fourth bite was single scale again you know it's like bang 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 going for them big ones then i'll call arthur on it you know so yeah. at the time you convince it's fish meals fish meals for the men sweeties for the boys you know you keep your bird yeah. foods and all your sweet flavored baits catch the yeah, smaller yeah, fish but yeah. i think nowadays it's probably evolved a bit but i do think when we was younger in the 80s and you make your own bait, you make your own recipes, roll your own bait each week and you tweak it and that you try and outfish your mates and mm. you don't tell them what you've done with your up to your flavour levels or lower them and yeah. all this, that and the other. Those sort of days, they're in a massive scale these days. So like, I've gone on quite hard late, like meal lane at Yateley in the past yeah. with a nut meal bait. Everyone's zig fishing, I'm catching them. You know, I'm fishing tight lines with rigs on the bottom, so they think I'm zigging as well. I'm using mm. hinge rigs, throwing sticking nut meal bo- uh, you know, nut meal baits out there, mm. all seven fish. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, everyone realises I'm catching them off the bottom, so everyone else goes on the bottom, and they're all using. I think at the time maybe something like the krill was the the in mm. bait like few years back and so everyone starts gunning the krill and my catch rate goes straight down because they got a better food source fish meal yeah and like my like sweetie attractor bait yeah yeah, not quite it's not out fishing them and not it it's on a bigger scale to the old ways isn't it it? yeah it's it's funny i think that you know when there's when there's a lot of good quality bait around as Mm. there is now it's a lot harder to stand out on your bait yeah definitely which is which is where i you know personally i'm quite a fan of liquids uh, a lot of the time yeah I, I think, think that's you know, the, you can, the future isn't it the liquids yeah you can you can jazz things mm. up and just make it you know not not just more attractive but mm. more nutritionally superior definitely by putting some of the the, the fantastic liquids around but I so, don't think the say the 80s when we used to make our own recipes all these different fish meals were available you could have yeah. capefin meal sardine meal mackerel meal you don't really see them now no. it's all lt94 or whatever isn't that's it, it. well I, we used, I don't know about you but we used to get asked from isaac spencer up in up in fleetwood right. he was the main fish meal manufacturer mm. for the whole of the country and they went bust a few years ago and as a result now i think a lot of stuff's imported in and it mm. is literally this is it that's fish yeah, meal that is it, but, you yeah. know you could get all of these different types mm. you know you, you could you could like shrimp meal, uh, uh, as a prime example, it was great for altering the buoyancy on the bank, yeah, wasn't it? As well. you know, yeah. There's all sorts of things. But you too do, much, but and it floated off in the wind, didn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> and, and people people don't quite have the understanding of bait that they used to have, mm. but actually they don't need it. It's a little bit like engines. Yeah. You know, in the in the in the in the car world, you used to have to know how your car worked because yeah. the chances are the bloody thing would break down oh, at yeah, some yeah. stage. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now, you know, you you give a mechanic a computer twenty years ago, he wouldn't yeah. know what to do with it. No. You give a mechanic a spanner now, yeah. he doesn't know what to do with it because well, everything's computerized. I've sort of, you know, grew up in an age of you, you know your car spluttering a bit, you take the distributor cap off, yeah. you know, scratch Just the old things WD up with WD, it. put it back <laughs> on, it. off you go again. Now yeah. you lift the bonnet up and you're like. 
there's a cover. Where's the battery? Yeah. <laughs> it's in the yeah, boot. Exactly that. <laughs> but, you know, it's that it's that evolution. It's that need-to-know mm. basis. But, mm. you, you know, uh, talking about bait, because you're obviously now with Outlaw Pro anyway, mm-hmm. you've had quite a few fish on, on our bait recently. You're doing quite well with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's almost six months a day since I joined. Um, I probably didn't join at the best time to be swi- switching bait companies. Yep. I mean, like, uh, and I was fishing the water, didn't have a great... Um, you know, winter form, so yeah. I was up against it, but I needed that confidence. I went to a runs water bang straight away, yeah. like two different baits. I think I used the Attract Natural and the Krilla. Yeah. That was on your recommendation when I come yeah. up, actually, and I found the Krilla work there, so straight away I'm confident in that. Yeah. Went on this other water with very low winter form, managed to catch a few out of there, so my confidence is scaling up now i'm on my main target water and i think i'm 19 nights in over seven weeks yeah. and i've caught 19 fish from there so yeah, i mean i'm not catching a fish per night it's not you know sometimes i don't yeah. catch a night and then i might catch two the next night or for, you know it, that's how it goes but the average is good and you yeah. know I'm, and did, that's on the krilla still is it that's on the krilla and i've sort of got out Again, old school. We like yeah. freezer bait, don't we? All yeah. the old school boys. You look at shelf life as we used to call it brick life and all that. Yeah, like, yeah. That's changed a lot, hasn't it? And yeah. Yeah, do you know absolutely. what I find the ease of using shelf life these days? It's so much easier. You can have it in the car spare. Yeah. You don't. You don't feel like you got to throw it in the lake because it's going to go off. You yeah. take it home if you don't use it. It's, it's you know. I'm, well, it's a lot more. It's a lot more usable as well because when you defrost a bait, mm. if you don't defrost it right. Mm then actually it can become soggy, you know, yeah, in the bag. The bottom right, of the bag's yeah. always going to be too much water yeah. in there. However however well you've kept your bait in the freezer, mm. actually, you know, when you defrost it, you can you can not spoil it, that's the wrong word, but you can affect how it behaves. Oh, yeah. Which is why these, you know, the the, the, the shelf life baits work well, so well. Like we were saying earlier about the old using fish oils to glug your baits up and that, if you throw oil on a frozen bait, it goes all buttery and horrible, yeah. doesn't it? So you kind of find that you have to thaw your bait out for a day, get rid of excess water, so it's not, you know, like it's, it's the moisture that makes your bait go mouldy at, at the end of the day, isn't it? Yes. And, um, but, yeah, with these shelf-life baits, you just pop the lid on the bucket, yeah. put your glug in, shake it up. Yeah. Like, say, so you done. do it a couple of days before, let it soak in, add more to it. Or, you Are know, you glugging it with salmon oil? Um, I started off just glugging it with acrylic glug, yeah, but yeah. now the water's warmer. I'm yeah. introducing a bit of salmon Same. oil in it as well. And that's it, the, they that's do, the one. it sucks it in. They're yeah. not rock hard. They're, no. they're, they're, they're nice yeah. baits. I'm impressed, to be honest, with shelf life bait. Yeah, that's uh, that's the one, the, the mix of the two, the, the, the glug through the yeah. cold months, and you're doing exactly yeah. the right thing. You know, as soon yeah. as you get that salmon oil on it yeah, as well, yeah. it just, it, 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 you know, salmon oil's an absolute classic. But yeah. I, I, I have this thing in particular that, um, you know, Coming up to spawning time, they have a certain type of nutritional requirement. As soon as they've spawned, mm. actually, they want to bulk back up again, and, and yeah, then is the time for high oil baits. Mm. You know, and then as soon as the water gets too hot, as soon as you get towards August, mm. actually, I sort of drop that oil down yeah, a little bit again. Yeah. But there's there's like a six week window yeah. now, where you know, smash it in mm. with a lot of gloved oil in yeah. it, and they just absolutely yeah, horse it down kind of works a bit like a hatch doesn't it you see yeah. your area pinging with it doesn't it so yeah it's mad yeah. on the subject of bait nigel's been out and he's been catching quite a few fish recently we just heard that he's been doing quite well on our bait but you know don't just listen to us here if you are watching on youtube have a look at this which is nigel out talking about how good the bait is if you're listening to this on the podcast do check out our youtube channel because there's a brilliant film of nigel talking about using our bait what's the future for for Nigel Sharp, where do you go now? You've you've got the one that you've, you you're looking for. You've had an awful lot of really big target fish through your period anyway. Uh, what is the future? You're after the Farnham Flint Biggie. Mm-hmm. Have you got your eye on another fish after that, or is it a case of you're so <laughs> tunnel vision that this is it? You're not moving. Do you do you fish anywhere else? I know winter's uh, a bit different because you get some bites and you want oh, a bit of action, but carry on as per with me target. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm going to catch it this year or whatever. If it gets caught, I might have a little excursion elsewhere, you yeah. know, and rethink it, come back. It depends, like, if it got caught, say, in the next couple of weeks, yeah. I'll give it a break for a couple of weeks and then I'll go back and carry on. Yeah. Autumn captures, once it gets caught, that's it, it's wrote off on it. But yeah. these days, since the COVID and the furlough period when angling exploded, quite a lot of clubs and lakes it's hard to get tickets in it so 
I've always been one over the years. I'd never join an, or never put my name on a waiting list. Right. And that's not because I'm specially privileged and expect to be given the golden key. I just look at lakes with waiting lists as being busy. So, yeah. you know, it's not a bit of me, but I found myself becoming a hypocrite because yeah. I've had to put my name down on a few lists and I've managed to acquire tickets because I've done it quickly before the list got too long. Yeah. You have to buy these tickets although they're sitting in your pocket doing nothing because yeah, yeah. I know a few people who've become very focused on a water and they've not bought any other tickets and they've either caught that fish or that fish has died or, yeah. they've, even they been, to go, then. or they've even been banned from the yeah. water and yeah. then they're like, what do I do? I've got nowhere to fish. Yeah. Well, you can't help you, mate. You can't just go and buy a club ticket. And it's, you know, days. it's a huge expense now, isn't yeah, it? it is, you know, yeah. th things like that. You, the, the the ticket that you've got for the one that you want to fish is expensive mm. enough, but having yeah. another one in the pipe, mm. that's, you know, and it could be three years. Well, you look at it, it's like relatively cheap for, for the ticket I hold for, you know, for yeah. the Pingewood, Air, um, yeah. whatever you call them lakes yeah, that's yeah. what the ticket is called like um, I think that's 350 quid for the night ticket right? yeah. and um, which is quite a lot of money but it's not when you yeah. think say a day ticket venue I'm not too in touch with day tickets I don't frequent them in the summer but yeah. generally I think you're looking at anything up to about 40 quid for an average yeah. day 30, ticket for, 30 quid is, your, is yeah. your starter it can go up to so 45 quid now. by the time you've done 10 nights mm. on a day ticket water that's yeah. your 350 quid ticket paid for isn't it so yeah, depends how much fishing you do a year really doesn't it so, yeah yeah no know. absolutely yeah. so well look good luck yeah with uh with your quest i don't think it's going to be long no, i think, I think you're gonna have it this summer <laughs> i think you're gonna, it doesn't come out yet this year not yet no so no. It, what is it twice a year fish yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's got your name on it, mate. It's got <laughs> it's so, right. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, it is always interesting getting inside the mind of any of our guests, and I'm sure you'll agree that Sharpie's mind is absolutely brilliant. A really nice insight into both the history of carp fishing uh, and also some huge historic carp and targets for the future as well. So whatever you're fishing for, just remember, go out there, go for it. It is your time. It's your opportunity. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast. We will be back with another one very soon. You know the drill in the meantime. Give us a like, a follow. Click all the things that you need to click. So from us here at Outlaw Pro, we'll see you again very soon. Thanks for listening to The Outcast, the podcast from Outlaw Pro, the ultimate angling experience. Remember to follow us on social media for updates and information on future guests. See you next time.